I think keeping it's, the poa. I think it's the single most important thing we do to maintain the poa population or the lack of poa population on these greens. I'm Michael Woods, the chief scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. I'm here with my good friend Bob Rayley, who is now the general manager of Thousand Acres Golf Club in Maryland at Deep Creek Lake. Bob, let's uh, have a look at the course and talk about some of your research about poa annua and phosphorus. Sounds perfect. All right, we'll show you a bit of the course. These are Penn A1, A4 greens, bent grass fairways, and we're gonna drive around and have a look on this beautiful spring day. How old is this green? Mm, would have been built in 08. Uh, yeah, would have been built in 2008. And poa free, can we find some poa? Uh, I might be able to walk around and find a few plants, particularly this time of year. You know, you've gotten something that germinated last you know, last fall, something like that, but they generally don't hang on. We, we do do a little bit of uh, physical removal. You know, we'll, we'll walk them in the spring and, and try to pick out any plants that we see, but they're generally pretty easy to see. And it's got, it got phosphorus at planting? Got phosphorus at establishment. We would have used just MAP as part of the seed seeding uh, application at seeding. We would put down a pound of, of phosphorus, P205, 13 years ago. 13 years ago. And, and no phosphorus we since. We haven't applied any phosphorus since. And you think that that it plays a big role in I think keeping it's, the poa? I think it's the single most important thing we do to maintain the poa population or the lack of poa population on these greens. Uh, and we soil test. We soil test annually to make sure that we don't have a phosphorus need. And we've never tested. My my uh, my level of phosphorus need might be a good bit lower than most, but we, we've tested and we maintain parts per million. Malik 3 from the Penn State lab, uh, almost always over 20 parts per million, uh, you know, high teens to 20 parts per million. So we've never never seen a need to and the make grass, a phosphorus application. And when you get high temperatures and uh, high growth potential for the bank grass, it still grows. Absolutely. Even though you're not applying the phosphorus. Absolutely. So you're, you're fine. We've yet to see any problems. We've never seen a physical sign of phosphorus deficiencies. Again, you see that purpling in the spring. Uh, we think that's more associated with the physiological nature of the A1, A4 bent grass than we do any phosphorus deficiencies. How old is this one? Same, same age? Same age. This would have been constructed in 2008. Uh, these would have been aerified. You know, you can still see the aerification. They would have been aerified. I think in uh, the first or second week of October. So in our climate, that means not a lot of, uh, a lot of time for good weather to, to grow back in and heal. Do you do snow mold on these? We do, absolutely. It's the most important thing we can do is snow mold. How uh, long is the typical snow cover? It varies. This year we probably had the least snow cover we've had in a long time, probably 60, 65 days. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to have over 115 days of snow cover. They look pretty clean now. You just yep. do one app in the fall? One app in the fall. That's all it takes. Um, so the fairways are a thatchy mess, you say, but they don't have POA. <laughs> no, they do not have, not that I've seen. Again, same, same approach with the fairways, even more restrictive on the fairways. I mean, the, the soil test results there are 30, 30, 40 parts per million. We return our clippings. There's, no, there's nowhere for the phosphorus to go. So there's no reason for additional phosphorus applications at all. So you're 13 years, no phosphorus correct just a single app at planting correct one pound a uh, pound of p2 or pound of p205 from map that's what they get at establishment and that's all they get wow these are pretty soft yep now again these were declaration is a is a pretty thatchy grass so we're fighting against that already and then in addition to that they haven't had the resources to uh they the so top soil here is a, a glacially formed, so there's a lot of boulders and rocks in it. So our, our, our soils are, 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 that we constructed with make aerification prohibitive. Uh, resources, they, the original plan was for regular top dressing of the fairways and, and verticutting slicing. I'm a huge believer in slicing fairways, um, but they didn't have the resources. We haven't had the resources over the last 10 years to do that with any regular consistent planning. You're a rare superintendent well, actually, you're not. You're a general manager. General manager. You, you are a rare general manager, former superintendent who has a master's degree in turfgrass science. 
Is that right? That's correct. That is correct. I was a an assist, assistant superintendent, and uh, I was running a crew, but I, I didn't feel like I was prepared agronomically. So I went through the two-year program at Penn State and had become uh, had developed a good relationship with George Hamilton at the time. And uh, George uh, I was ready to have a graduate student, and he invited me to come back to Penn State to be his, his graduate student. And I, I felt like I needed that. I, I, I wasn't prepared agronomically to be a superintendent. So I had the chance to... Uh, to go back to grad school and like most grad students i didn't pick my project right most grad students get their projects sort of handed to them and mine was on uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, interactions particularly phosphorus and its impact on uh, poa annual or annual bluegrass encroachment so um i uh, my the official title of my research project was uh nnp interactions or influence on newly or creeping on annual bluegrass encroachment into newly established creeping bentgrass putting greens so i did this work oh my it's been 15 over 15 years ago uh where we we, we looked at uh phosphorus and nitrogen rates on the impact of uh annual bluegrass encroachment on a on a a1 a4 green that was i want to say two years old i think when the project started and if I remember right, there was a significant difference in the amount of annual bluegrass that established on those young greens when phosphorus was withheld or when phosphorus was applied. Absolutely, and there, there was an interaction with nitrogen, very much very logical in the way that you would expect, right? Additional nitrogen actually uh, improved uh, the, the bent grass, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of the rising, uh, rising tide that rises all boats, right? The increasing nitrogen just enhanced what we did with the phosphorus. So there was a, an interaction, but the real heart of it was, was the phosphorus levels. Uh, as we increased phosphorus, and we had a zero phosphorus, and as we increased phosphorus, we saw a linear relationship or an increase in, in um, annual or annual bluegrass establishment into this new newly established putting green. Where we put no uh, phosphorus down, we actually reduced. So when the project started, the, the green had on average about 10% annual bluegrass already established in the green, and at the end of the study, in two years, the, the plots that had no phosphorus and high levels of nitrogen to promote that growth had reduced uh, annual bluegrass percentage it over by over half so they were down to like four or five percent annual bluegrass how did, uh, how, when you're doing the percentages how do you remember how you measured that we used a square grid method it laid we laid a square square grid right on the plots and and counted you know the intersect points there was 100 intersect points and that's how we, we okay so it's the presence bluegrass. at the intersect point presence or lack of presence of poa annual correct that's and, how we did it cool so uh, what we found, and then when you extrapolate the data out, obviously we tied those annual bluegrass uh, concentrations to um, uh, uh, phosphorus levels in the soil test results. And you know, at the time, the Penn State recommendation, I think, was minimum level of phosphorus, malic three phosphorus for creeping bent grass putting greens, was 53 parts per million. I believe since then, with I, I assume my research aided in that, they, they lowered that number, I believe, into the 20s or maybe the low 30s. Um, but the research, and I think they did that comfortably, you know, they felt like that was a comfortable place to go. But the research showed we were maintaining very healthy bent grass with no signs of phosphorus deficiencies at nine parts per million, uh, definitively, uh, with plots, you know, specifically individual plots that had five parts per million, again, with, with no signs of phosphorus phosphorus deficiency. So I utilize that on the golf course today. And you've utilized that with success for 13 years That's now, correct. and you can see that those greens are still pretty. Yep. And you don't have a pole encroachment problem. No, we've never seen, uh, we, again, we don't have a, a, a problem. And there are, you know, uh, there is a, a local golf course that was built around the same time that, you know, I, I don't know their management practices per se, but I've, I know there is annual bluegrass pressure. Their greens, you know, their practice greens probably 70% annual bluegrass. So I know the pressure is here. It could have happened, but we've maintained um, with that strategy, along with the regular use of a cutlass growth regulator, We've maintained these greens, uh, essentially, I, I'd say they're power free. Awesome, so you you know the MLSN uh, guidelines, and the guideline for phosphorus is uh, 21 parts per million. And you think, I, I guess you'd say that's really safe. It's so very you're, safe. You're happy to go to 21 and just kind of keep going, but yep. maybe, maybe be aware of 
you you still soil test once a year? Correct. We soil test uh, every uh, every fall or, or every spring, um, and and we try to, or, or both at, at times, and uh, we we check the phosphorus levels. And again, I I would say those greens are coming in in the in the high teens for the most part these days, um, and I have no intentions of, of uh, making a phosphorus application. And you're not going to apply phosphorus based on the soil test. You're going to apply Correct. it based on, on the bent grass failing. C Correct. But you're monitoring the soil test just so you know for your site at what level you might need to apply. That's right. Yeah, we're looking, we're monitoring plant response more than use the soil test. The soil test is just kind of an affirmation that, that we're in the right range and we're seeing no indication that we, we need to apply phosphorus. Do you... Um, do you tissue test at all, or, or do you think you've got it covered with, with? So we will tissue test a time or two in the in the in the summer. I look at tissue testing as, as kind of a, a as a check to you know we we, we apply other micronutrients etc. And I use that as a check just to make sure that we're maintaining proper levels for for micronutrients things that you know maybe not may not show up visually as easily as as uh, other. Uh, uh, other nutrient deficiencies might, deficiencies might, but it's utilized again as a check, not as a as a precursor to making an application. Oh, cool! Thank you. That that is a great summary of how you apply that research and what the uh, what the research shows. And I just think it's fascinating, and I'm surprised sometimes at how turfgrass managers in general if we look at the industry as a whole and turf grass managers in general they will tend to apply complete fertilizer thinking that that adding phosphorus might help sometimes i see like you know at aerification guys put out this earthworks product like a 626 or something and i'm just like what are you doing uh, if if you already have enough phosphorus why would you apply any more of course these are all great products but with phosphorus specifically, especially with creeping the creeping bent grass versus poa annual competition thing, it's like, man, w wouldn't you try to minimize phosphorus? And you know this, and why doesn't everybody know this? That's a great question, Mike. And I think, uh, and and we do know this, and it, it's it's not a it's not a leap in my eyes. I think we all understand that one of the most stable nutrients in the soil is the phosphorus. So when you have a soil test or you see a phosphorus level, you know that doesn't change dramatically year to year. So it's not an element that you know, and like. We, we don't even necessarily use soil tests for nitrogen levels because of this. You know, th th there's so much variability in how level, soil levels can change for so many nutrients. Phosphorus is the one that's least likely to change. And we forget that, I think, in regards to, like you said, we complete fertilizer. We've got to put a little bit of everything down. And, and in this case, I think we need to take a step back and realize that, that phosphorus is extremely stable in the soil. It's it's clearly more critical at establishment we we also understand that i think we know when we start starter fertilizers have p we understand all of this you know at, a, at the highest level it just seems to be when it comes to pra into practice we we get a little maybe gun shy and we just go ahead and go with that complete fertilizer thank you bob it has been great having a look at thousand acres with you today and talking a bit about your research so thank you very much i can't wait to come back up here to the lake and uh see some more great grass conditions at another time of year. Awesome. You're always invited back, Micah. Thank you.